Ladies and gentlemen, what's up? Uh, this is Questlove, another episode of Questlove Supreme. Here uh, with my my crew, my team Supreme in the house. Uh, Laia, how are you? I'm How's it going? Today, I am doing I know. You know I'm yeah, listening. Yo, Dude, I know think Fonte was here first. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. Uh, Fonte uh, was here first. I've been waiting on this one, man. I know. Sugar Steve, how goes it? That's good, Sugar Steve. I'm, exactly. I'm so happy. Anyway, <laughs> I think we're, both both Sugar Steve and I are, are doing this from um, from 30 Rockefeller Plaza. And it's so weird that for it to be a communications uh, media company. They have some of the worst uh, Internet uh, Wi-Fi in this building. So really, you know, yeah, you got to get in where you fit in. All right. There's Steve. Okay. How you doing, Steve? How's life? I'm doing great. Life is great. I love this podcast. I love you. And hello Thank to you. our guests. Great. We love you too. Absolutely. Are you back? Fon Sigalo. Yeah, cooler, man. Cooler, man. Uh, this is one for the record books. Man, How's it listen, going? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm chilling. I'm really excited about this episode today. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about it this morning, and I realized that this podcast is probably the antidote to my Instagram account, which, of course, you know, my Instagram account could be another person's obituary. It's like you don't like my Instagram is you don't want to be on that summer jam screen. Like, ah, will uh, I be there next? Is he going to be right about me, you know, next and the life I lived and, you know, my death? But, um, you know, Fonte actually brought up a point that, you know, sometimes we just need to give people their flowers. And I mm -hmm. think it's rather I think it's rather apropos that we're taping this episode, um, especially after what I dubbed the versus comedy hour. Oh, yes, Amir. <laughs> Talk about it, brother. Come on. For real, for real. <laughs> no, because I, I, I feel I honestly feel like if there ever was um, a paradigm shift or a kind of um, kind of a, a, a sea change and just in the process of of what art is um you could probably say that our guest today um was probably the last mohican um, and this is not to you know is this is not to uh you know call out other singers that mm -mm. came after our guest and whatnot but mm -mm. i just feel as though um just the 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 level of of taking your craft seriously um, especially for black music is, you know, it's, it's, I, I feel as though it's, it's kind of in, in danger or at least, at least at a DEF CON five situation. If you, if you, you know, y'all just got to read between the line. Like our, our, our guest today is, uh, definitely probably master, master vocalist. I mean, he's been our favorite for so long and we've been dying to get him on the show. Um, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome freaking Tevin Campbell is on Quest Love Supreme. Yes, we indeed. did this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tevin Campbell is honored to be on. Tevin oh, crap. Is to be on. I, I actually thought this was, <laughs> I don't know why I just thought, you know, that you be unobtainable or just not interested in doing it. I, I don't even know how we started. I think I just, you know, shot my shot and DMs is like, yo, we, yeah. we got this, we got, the, you know, like. You sent a text like, I got him. <laughs> yeah, dog. I, I didn't even think you would answer. I was just like, yeah, he's not going to answer. First of all, we know each other. We run into each other all the time. Right. You know, through the years. And right. uh, no, I don't usually do interviews and stuff like that, but you know what? Quest are you fucking kidding me? Are you Thank kidding you, man. Me? Oh, nah, I'm, really honored. Today, I'm honored. I'm honored. Oh, nah, you ain't you a family today, bro. We just chopped <laughs> yeah. yeah. talking shit. So let's mm -hmm. go. You know it's weird. You know it's weird. Okay, so when I was when I was looking up um just like your basic information, it's kind of weird how perception is, you know, like throughout the years, because like okay, me sitting in the movie theater watching graffiti bridge, like watching you act. Or just like even on the freshman, of uh, like generally just knowing you, like whatever your yes. videos or whatever. I think in my mind, 
from this from this perspective, me as a 51 year older, I would say like uh, probably like 20, almost 30 years older than him. And it's so weird how like I know you were born in 76, which basically you're just five years younger than me. But it's so weird, like at 20, I felt you were like, like in my mind, I'm like, oh, he must have been four years old or five years old, even though you're just five years younger than me. Because he was living a grown ass life. Remember, we was like, wow, look, at his life must be awesome. <laughs> yeah, man. So it's, it's just weird how like we're actually like closer in age and peer wise. But I don't know. My perception back when I was 20 was like you were way, way, way younger than me. Which is now is like well, okay, you're kind uh, of four or five years younger than me, which is kind of like we're the same age. It's this is no. weird that how that works. A lot of people say now, that. Shut up, Laya. Laya, <laughs> <laughs> tell me, no, you're not. I'm just trying to help. Kev. Yeah, Tevin, go ahead. I'm sorry, Tev. Go ahead. No, it, it. A lot of people say that, but I think that's the power of the childhood stardom uh, right. phenomenon. You know, I mean, <laughs> to this day, I get you know people come to me. They're like, you know. Oh, you're Tammy Campbell, but you look older. You have gray hair, you know, like. Oh, everyone still thinks you're You're supposed to be. (laughs) But that's just the way the brain works, you know? Like, if you were introduced as a child, everybody's going to remember, and especially if you made some sort of impact. Um, And, you know, I was blessed to have made an impact Mm -hmm. as a kid. People remember that. And so, to this day, I get that same thing. So, you're not the only one. Well, thank you again for doing this for us. Where where are you talking to us now from? Where, Where are you? I am in New York. All right. So we always start with the same question. Um, I well, first of all, do you, what? What was your first musical memory in life? Uh, my aunt giving me the uh, Amazing Grace album, the Aretha Franklin Amazing Grace album mm. on vinyl. She gave yeah. it to me when I was, I think, I was. That was the first album that I listened to continuously. Uh, I think I was maybe eight or nine. She gave that to me. So now her version of "Holy Holy" yeah. is just like, yeah. come on, man, what are we talking about? Yeah. Well, her version of "Amazing Grace" is is yeah. is incredible. I mean, even though the song was written by a slave owner, I didn't know that until years after. Uh, right. Like a couple of years ago, I learned that. But anyway, she Makes sings sense. it like no. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. What was uh, so? What was it like for you to see? Uh, the film version of that after having lived with it so long um you mean you mean the uh her aretha's Aretha's film version she you know when she was alive she they tried to bring it out maybe like you know like 20 years ago and because of some sort of contractual dispute Mm -hmm. she didn't allow it so of course she had to pass away were you able to see the documentary or the 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 concert the film which the, the Amazing Grace, the live, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, I thought it was beautiful. It, it, she was in a point in her life where she was very happy, and not that she wasn't happy at any point in her life, but she was glowing and she was, uh, she had this afro, and it was just beautiful, right. man. And you know, seeing her in her element, I think is was the most beautiful thing. I think that people were touched by seeing that film because you don't know a lot of time. I mean, a lot of people don't know that she sat and played that piano, a lot of the songs that she did and a lot of songs on Amazing Grace album too. So to see her sitting there in her element playing the piano and singing is just amazing all the time. So that was- Yeah, pe- that was- most people don't know that she's like a, just as good as a piano player as she is a exactly. singer. Yeah, yes. it was important for yes. people to see that. Um, yes. So can you tell me about your, where were you born? I was born in Dallas, Texas. Hey. From Dallas. Hospital. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm a country boy. I'm trying to hide right. my accent, but it's actually gonna start coming out. It's my first glass of wine. So once I get a second glass of wine, then- oh, that's what we're doing. <laughs> I didn't know. Well, that. I'm, well I'm a wine guy. Oh you know, no, so this I, this might be a, a Denise uh, Williams episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying. Let me go get my box. I ain't trying to start no problems. <laughs> it ain't a problem. All right. So you, you grew up in Dallas. Um, just in general, what was your, you know, your formative years like as far as like how you discovered music and th- like, did you discover it with that album or were you coming out the womb singing oh. it? Oh, no, I was my mom. I was coming out the womb singing. I was singing since I was three years old. My mom 
said I used to go up to the speaker and just hold my ear up to the speaker and sort of like just imitate anything that was coming out of the speaker. Uh, I was into cars and singing. I remember when I was little, I used to run my hands on the side of cars like my hand was a car. It, I, that was how infatuated I was with cars. And singing was just a part of my, I did, that was just who I, what I knew how to do. I mean, I, you know, people would give me 50 cents or a dollar or two dollars to sing for them, you know. That was, I didn't think of it as a, a, anything particularly special. It was mm -hmm. just something that, that uh, was, I just knew how to do it, you know. I could see the effect I had on people, but uh, I grew to love it as I grew older. I didn't really, it was just a part of me. It was just something that I could do. Um, I didn't see it as a talent or anything like that. I was, it was just, I was a kid, you know, I didn't really, I didn't really get what talent was. People were, you know, you're really talented, you know, but I didn't understand any of that when I was so a kid. How old would you say you were when, okay, this is the lane that you're going to be in. This is, this is your calling. Just like, I mean, besides singing with records, whatnot, officially, like how, what, what age do you consider you actually starting your, your craft? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, well, it definitely wasn't while I was a kid. <laughs> it was it was uh i didn't see it as a craft i just i was just doing what i knew how to do i didn't see it as uh something i took it for granted when i was a kid so did your mother uh, see it first then is that what happened my mom grew up seeing it also so okay okay yeah you know, she she yeah she saw it she saw it for everybody saw it uh but like i like like i said like you know I did talent shows at school and stuff like that. And, but I didn't walk around like thinking that I was a good, I didn't, I was just singing. Like it wasn't something special. It was, I wasn't, uh, I didn't consider it special. So you were the last to know? It, I did. Hmm. Uh, hmm. <laughs> was I the last to know? Hmm. Like, did everyone know like, ah, like were you waking up at like out of sleep, like sing for the people or? <laughs> I think I was thrown into the business so fast that like, like so early that um, I didn't really get a chance to, to understand, like talent and all that, I didn't really understand what that meant. I was just doing something that I love to do. Right. I didn't think that I was talented because of it at the time. I didn't understand what that meant. I didn't understand what that meant until probably, uh, well, when I started with Quincy and, and started singing for Quincy and, like, I, and I realized who he was, because I didn't know. Of course. Before I met him, I didn't know who he was. Right. But then, you know, Sarah Vaughn and Ella Fitzgerald and all these people, I started to realize, hmm, you, you know, I knew I could sing. I just didn't think of it as uh, it better than something me. that was just a part of me. That was just That's probably that a good thing. Yeah. That's probably I think it thing. was a good thing. Yeah. Uh, for your first yeah. talent show, do you know what you sang? Oh, my God. I did Whitney Houston, Greatest Love of All. It was absolutely God awful because it was too high. So and I was so I was so nervous and I was shaking the whole time I was singing it. And my coach, the PE coach, was like, dude, why did you sing it so high? I was like, I want to do it in the original key. I was like nine years old, you know. Oh, but so when you modulate it, like, you just <laughs> Whoa, I don't know if you call it a modulation. Uh it was it was horrible. It was horrible. I wish I know somebody recorded that, but yeah, that was bad. I wasn't good at talent shows or anything like that. I wasn't good at that. Uh, but that was, was your go-to song? Oh yeah, Whitney. Whitney was my go-to artist when I was growing up, all into my adulthood, and young adulthood and everything. She yeah, was I was gonna born. say, who who's the artist that, or who are like the three artists that are your North Stars as far as like, who, at least when you're singing, that you're gravitating towards them besides Whitney? I don't know. <laughs> I, um, I try to lately. I've been trying to sort of when I was when I was younger. I definitely gravitated to, towards Whitney. Everything I did, it was Whitney. I literally idolized the lady, mm -hmm. her stage movements and everything. I, it was she was literally everything to me. But now it changes every couple of years. I discovered new singers, like Patsy Cline. To me, is one of the best singers in, 
pocket. Like she, her, her voice moves me more than a lot of other voices that she would think would move me more than hers. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I told my brother, Patsy Klein, she could sing. He was like, ah, she all right. She ain't doing no riffs or nothing. She's just staying in one tone, but it's not, it's not all about that. It's about what is behind her voice. You know, I hear all that. I'm very sensitive to that. So, so but Donnie Hathaway, Aretha Franklin and Whitney Houston, definitely are the three. Mm. Okay, so for our listeners out there who um, are are not as uh, steeped into like vocal technique and all those things, what is it? Because I, I find that as an interesting answer. I actually, I I like singers who uh, sort of don't come out the gate flexing. I mean, nothing against Christina Aguilera, but you know she goes from zero to Autobahn in like 1.2 seconds, <laughs> you know, whatever her, her volume is. <laughs> but, you know, I, I just, for, for you though, what is it? Cause I often like singers that have that ability, but often hold back what they have. I, Cause I think that's a gift to, to, to sort of sing it flat and then, you know, sort of rise to the occasion. What is it about a singer like Patsy Cline that you look for? Like when you hear a singer, how do you know okay, they have a good voice or what is it that you, is this something scientific that you can actually explain or is it just like what you feel? Well, it's, it, yeah, it, well, it's not all about what you feel and it's not all about how good they sing. It's about how they interpret a song. Every song is not meant for runs and, and things like that. So being a great singer is not all about how your voice sounds when you're singing a song. It's about how you're feeling the song and how you're living the song as you're singing the song. Uh, I can, I could name you a couple of singers that have actually great technical voices, but they're not good at exuding the emotion and the, and the life of the song, you know? So it's, 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 there is definitely some science to that. Any I hope I favorites? Answered, I answer your questions? <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. Any, I mean, it's like the Mary versus Faith argument. Like Faith mm. is technically like the, the, better singer and i'm putting that in big quotation marks but mary the material. you feel mary yeah you feel mary yeah i would i would totally i would i wouldn't say that one is better than the other one but i would say that mary is definitely more raw than mm -hmm. faith um it's just like uh i mean I, and i can like i said before i can name you various singers that have these amazing voices but display no emotion i i and you know it's it's not something that you learn. It's something that you uh, embody. And you don't have to actually have went through these songs, subject, the subject of the song. It's just about how you take it and make it your own. It's like an actor does when he, you know, plays a role. Okay. And you know what I'm saying? You have to take it and, and you use it in a, in a way that you can understand it. I get it. So there's All a lot right. of science behind it. All right, so I have a question. Um, now that I know that you live in this area, um, <laughs> asking, are you, uh, you know, are you are you uh, familiar with the borough of Harlem, specifically, a a restaurant called uh, Red Rooster? And I'm only specifically asking <laughs> because if you are a New York resident and you decide to go to Red Rooster on a Sunday, um, they kind of do something very different up there. I th they're now doing something different with like a gospel choir, but like the first five years of that restaurant, um, often um, jazz flautist, um, I, is flautist a, is a, like a past yeah. tense? I'm glad to see if Bill, if Bill Sherman was here. I feel like he'd start making fun of me. Um, jazz flautist Bobby Humphrey used to host Oh shit! Um, kind of the Sunday brunch thing, which is kind of cool, but it's also a thing where, you know, if you're like knee deep in smothered chicken or something, she'll have a microphone in front of your face, like, you know, like Dinah Ross, like puts you on the spot to sing, reach out and touch someone's <laughs> hands, <laughs> and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, oh god, Bobby Humphrey's like in my face again with a microphone. Um, I, I believe that I heard the story that when you were younger, she's the one that sort of started the ball running. Uh, Roland, yeah. can you explain like her yeah. her position in your life? Because you know, for a lot of hip hop fans, 
Bobby Humphrey uh, was Mizell part of that. Brothers. Yeah, the Mizell Brothers, like the, the 70s okay. Blue Note catalog. Many a hip hop samples have come from her. Um, mm. First of all, were you Didn't familiar with who she was when you first met her? Or was it just like, oh, this lady was in the business once and no, I was know. 11. I didn't, I was 11. No, okay. I didn't know who she was. Right. Uh, so what happened was her brother uh, were, were, and my mother were good friends. I think they went to work together at the post office. My mom used to work at the post office. Okay. Um, and uh, he knew I could sing. So she lived in here in New York and he called her up on the phone and I sang for her on the phone. And I think it was, you bring me joy, Anita Baker. Anita Baker, okay, gotcha. And she had this club called Sweetwaters and in New York and she flew me out. And uh, <laughs> I wore this white tuxedo coat and this tux and this uh, bow tie and I was what, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And I did uh, once, twice, three times, I think, uh, by what? How I Did. Oh, I think okay. that's the song I did. <laughs> oh. I thought you meant Lionel Richie. I'm like, Me too. That's why I was like, wait, what? That's a mature <laughs> song. No, then I kiss you once. It no, it was Howard Hewitt. Oh, twice. Okay. Oh, that's the shit. Yeah, yeah. Three yeah. times. I was, I was, yeah, in front of all these grown people drinking at this club. <laughs> so it was, and you had I no did, idea what you were saying. You had no idea. No, what you were I, no. I, but I knew the songs, though. That's what I meant about saying before. Like, you, yeah. you know. Um, uh, so anyway, yeah, Bobby Humphrey, and she shot and she sent that videotape to like numerous record companies and uh, numerous. I mean, I met everybody, Mo Austin, I met everybody. Kenny G was at Aristid, he gave me a saxophone. Anyway, I'm rambling. Wait, time mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. no, and There's no rambling in Quest Love <laughs> Also, you got, you got to understand the type of show that this is. Tell him, Amir. Mm -mm. Like, we're, we're less about, we're less about like gotcha journalism and more about like, the craft of of how mm -hmm. your art is so we're, we're kind of nerd in, shit yeah we're kind of into that nerd it. sort of stuff <laughs> yeah so what so you're you're basically saying that you were 11 at the time and well i know you got your deal at 12 so it basically took a year to get that ball ro rolling yeah because we went we met a lot of different people and um quincy was a lot he was the one that got me um so i mean yeah, so you a had a chance of... to go to Arista. Yeah, well, it was. Wait, first of all, why did he give you a saxophone? Kenny I know Kenny G. G. Uh... I didn't even. I didn't even get the Kenny G. Home game. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck, Kenny? <laughs> well, at least the he gave me a Starbucks or something. Right, right. <laughs> he gave me a saxophone. I that you know. I think that's probably when I started to realize you know because I knew who he was. I knew that. I knew that song. I, he had a huge hit at the time, and Songbird. I knew it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really cool. And um, anyway, mm. yeah. So she 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 was the reason why I uh, I was signed to uh, Quest Warner Bros. I mean, she was the reason why that tape got to Quincy. That was the tape that Quincy actually saw. He was like, "Yeah, let's sign this kid." So. Wow. So Key Walker. I see Benny that. Medina saw it first, and then Quincy. So Benny Medina okay. saw it more first. Of course. Sorry. <laughs> so can you walk us? through the process or at least what you remember the process of like I, I assume first coming to LA and meeting these people like you know you're meeting all these legends um and I'm certain that you wouldn't know half of them Who, who's the first person that made an impression on you like I know who this person I is, is right. and I can't <laughs> believe I'm meeting them as opposed to oh, like Michael. oh Sarah Vaughn who are you like, yeah right <laughs> Michael Jackson was the oh, guy I didn't know. oh okay I didn't know. <laughs> Michael Jackson was the first person that I met that uh, like I knew who he was and but not even it wasn't even Prince mm -hmm. you know Prince didn't really I Prince knew who Prince was but I, I knew who he was you know but Michael wow Michael Jackson, for the kids you know what I'm saying yeah. wow all right wait you I know? got I have a back on the block question <laughs> and and hopefully <laughs> you can offer just a tiny bit of insight. Because I, I don't so. even think we asked this on the Quincy Jones episode that's never ever coming out. Yes, Tevin. We we talked to oh, Quincy. No. For, we talked to Quincy for four hours and Quincy in his living room. Real Quincy. Wow. Quincy. Oh, speaking yeah, of the wine. Get... So. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it's not, no, no, no. It's not even salacious. It's not even salacious. <laughs> but I, I pretty much, I think we all basically know 
that he was the missing link on back on the block as far as not being on the secret garden. And, you know, I'll, I'll be sure told us that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. th that Michael was supposed to be on secret garden. Instead, I'll be sure got the spot. D do you were you at all privy to the situation in 88, 89 when he might show up, might not show up? That oh, you could we sort of kind of share. <laughs> I was a kid. No, I didn't know anything. All right, about all right, that. All right. I, no, trust me. If I did, I'd tell you. But I, I was, a, I was a kid. So there, I, I was just in awe of everything. So okay. You know, there, there's a yeah, curious no. moment on um, BT where Quincy and Sarah Vaughn are sitting with um, Donnie Simpson, and you know, as as a person that often talks like inside baseball to like people like. I could say something to one of my band members that none of the audience would know anything. And I guess Donnie Simpson had asked, like, well, why isn't Michael Jackson on the record? And Sarah Vaughn sort of shot a look at Quincy and said something in coded speak. And Quincy and her just started laughing. And, you know, like Donnie's like, let me in on the joke. He's like, no, it's best we not do that. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I just generally wanted to know if, if you knew. Well, that. I mean, I, I do know that there was a falling out between the two. That's all I know. It's good you were able to be a kid, though. That's cool. That's cool. I'm just glad yeah, you was yeah. able to be a kid because it seems like for as a kid watching you be a kid that you didn't have a lot of opportunities to be a kid during those times. So, yeah. well, it wasn't a normal childhood, but I was we were able to 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 be uh, mischievous, mischievous sometimes, but it was mostly working. So, you know. That's, that's what I did. Because you I were out of the classroom setting by this time, right? Like as a kid? Yeah, I, I, well, I went to a private school. I love the um, way you said it, private school, all right. I did say that. It was here snobby. for private school. <laughs> I said that very snobby. <laughs> that's the why, that's the why. <laughs> I went I went to a private school. No, it was uh, not How? like, I, when I moved to LA, I went to a private school and, uh, but I was never there. I was never there. So. Right. So you weren't able to have like bonding or it's just like regular. Uh, very rare that I was in school consistently for like weeks and months. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the school that I attended, a lot of celebrity kids went to. So uh, like Rod Stewart's daughter and all mm -hmm. the Jackson, all the Jackson kids went there. Okay. All, and Rashida and Kadada, everybody went there. So it was one of those, one of those private schools, but I was a kid from Texas. So this was this was new for me, but I was never there. But when I was there, I got in trouble and got detention every other day because I never came in uniform. When I came in uniform, my tie wasn't done all the way or my, my shirt was untucked. I was always causing problems at that school, but I was allowed to because I was- Kevin Campbell. I was the one, I was <laughs> <laughs> that to get away with a lot of stuff. But um, yeah, yeah. Like he was this, just on Fresh Prince last week. Calm down. Oh, <laughs> wow. It keeps showing that episode. It's really cool, though, that they keep showing that. That's great. At the top of this episode, when I was talking about being a seasoned singer, um, at least for people that sang, and you're definitely sang, you're, you know, like you're a singer, you. singer. Um, at this point, is, you know, Seth Riggs a part of your exercise? Or, I mean, I would assume that Someone must have suggested, like, okay, you got to warm your voice up and all that stuff. Did you? Were you a, a, a student of of the great Seth Riggs as a vocal trainer? Oh, I mean, I thought you did. Now, yeah, I did go to Seth Riggs where my voice was changing to the point where I couldn't. I could. I was ah, uh, like there was no control, like the puberty part when that hit. So I had to literally do. Tell me what you want me to do live, and that's when it hit. So I couldn't hit to. So you started lower, lowering the key, <laughs> modulating the key down, so that no, you match it. no, no, we couldn't do that. Not when you, not when you're 14 years old. You can't lower the key. You got to do it. You know. So that's what? when I started. Yeah, there's no, there's uh, no such thing. I can do that now. I'm 45. You know, it makes sense to lower the key to that. Side. Right. But when you're 14, no. So I had to go to Seth Briggs for I went for the whole like a summer because it was really bad. I had no control over that break. And he taught me how to sort of control it. After that, there's no, I didn't go back to it. How many, so when you're training, how many hours 
what's the daily regimen? I mean, how many hours is it a day or is it just once a week or? Well, first of all, you go into his office and you do a whole bunch of exercises. So you mean for me at, for a show or just? No, no, for you, for you with oh. Seth Riggs. Okay, yeah, you just go in and he just gives you exercises to do for like 30 minutes. You could pay for an hour, he'd do an hour. And he okay. was charged like 2000 per hour. <laughs> so like it, was something Yikes. Ridiculous. it was something ridiculous. It was something ridiculous. And he used to talk half the time. He used to talk <laughs> half the time. <laughs> half, the, half the lesson, he used to talk half the time, which was, you know, but he did that consistently. He was a great, he was a great teacher. Though. I learned a lot. From him that I use to this day, like warm up exercises and all kinds of. Uh, for uh, for, for our listeners out there, um, Michael Jackson's two hour tutorial is still surprisingly still on YouTube, which is basically two hours of hearing Michael Jackson do all the scales. Yeah. <laughs> and no, 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 no. Like all yeah. the, like yeah. I, that's probably one of the greatest vocal exercise educations that you can get for free. Uh, while it's it still works. up. Oh, nice. Okay. And it works. I mean, that's all Seth. Yeah, he was a, he was an avid student. But Seth had a lot of great, a lot of great, um, great clients. But yeah, like I said, yeah, that stuff works, man. All that stuff works. All that stuff. It works. Because all it's doing is just, you know, sort of warming it up. So <laughs> between, between, um, you know, we were introduced to you via back on the block, but um, when you were when you were brought out there, did you immediately start working on your debut album or was it just back on the block? Let's see what happens first. OK, now you get a record deal or was it just like out the gate? You're going to work on your album and subsequently get introduced from Quincy. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Um, Man, thirty years. Huh? Like, I, yeah. well, I was I was twelve years old. Um, I knew I know that uh, after uh, the introduction to Prince, when Benny introduced Benny Medina introduced me to Prince, and I did the uh, Graffiti Bridge, mm -hmm. round and round, round and round. I know that he wanted to be on the first album. I remember that, and Warner Brothers, uh, Warner Brothers with me. Like, oh my god, it was all kinds of crazy stuff. Wait, in the water, but ah, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> what year did you what year did you demo the all right? Here's the thing. Everyone knows that I'm a Prince Stan. And of you course. know, and also the Prince the, the, what I call the orgers, the Prince.orgers is sort of they always side eye me when I start, <laughs> you know, talking my 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 trash. Now, I mean this is the thing, everyone knows that he's my North Star, as far as creativity is concerned, but you know, it it's to a lot of Prince people that are very honest with themselves, they would also know that that period was a rather questionable period of his life. And I got to hear uh, the P, the the song that you you demo. Did he demo in the way that you're? Smiling right I now. I don't even remember. I don't even remember doing it. I swear to God, I tell you, I don't remember where we were. I don't remember what year that was. But all I know is that he, I was in the middle of, of that. I was in the middle of that whole thing. And that didn't stop until after I'm ready. Okay. You know, oh, he, wow. Based, based, wow. On, based, on, based on what I can tell, because, you know, I heard his, I heard his demo guide and I heard your version. And you literally followed everything to a T. Yeah. So I would basically <laughs> say that if you're working with him, is it just a, assume that, OK, do exactly what I do on this track and follow it to it? Is he there coaching you or is it just sort no. of like? No, he's not. It's just okay. me. That's me. I, I wasn't very um, experiment. I didn't experiment a lot when it came to him. Uh, I kind of sing it like the demo. Uh, the only songs I drifted away from the demo was sort of was "Can We Talk," and I'm ready. All those songs, Babyface tracks. Uh, yeah. Uh, so tomorrow, and tomorrow not at all because it was just that's no, tomorrow least. was all me. That was me because yeah. it wasn't it was no vocals to that song. So that was she just wrote my... that literally in the studio. 
That was my way of easing tomorrow in there because we I was just because I know we kind of skipped over and I was going to ask you when you got tomorrow. Well, we, we was on back on the block. We kind of went, we was, you know, moving on. Uh, but right. I was just going to ask when you got tomorrow as a fan of Whitney, did you feel like that was kind of like your Whitney song in a way? Did you feel, no. you remember how you felt as a kid? Oh, 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 I, you know I, I didn't. You mean now that I listen to it now? When I listen to it? Well, either now, way, or, I was, or... I guess I was asking when you, as a kid, because you were a fan of Whitney's when you were a kid. So I was just curious if you were like, you know what? This feels like my sake, not my saving all my love, my, uh, Greatest, greatest love of all. all. Greatest, thank you, greatest love of all. Your, your signature uh, song. I, I don't, I didn't think that then, but I, I wasn't processed. My brain wasn't processed enough to think like that because <laughs> I was too, I, I was too self-conscious mm. in the studio. But I do think that sort of now, like when I listen to Tomorrow and one song, um, the sort of inspirational songs that I have, a couple that I do have. I have some more, but they're not on my albums. But anyway, I do think that now. Oh. All uh, right. Well, eventually, I assume that you got to meet her. What was it, what was it like for you to uh, meet her? <laughs> oh, Where did God. you meet her? Okay. Um, the first time I met Whitney Houston, she invited me to her listening party or her after party. It was some sort of party. Um, I, I think it was the listening party for Omni Baby tonight. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I, and I just, it, but it, then the second time, which was more personable, was when I, we were, at the, it was the hotel called the Riga Royal, which okay. is now the London or the Conrad. But it, oh, it was yeah. The Riga okay. Royal. You remember? Mm -hmm. uh, it was her and Bobby, and I was coming out of my room and something, and they were coming down the hall, and we had this whole long conversation. She was like, How you doing? I was like, I'm doing fine. How you doing? Wait, he's just doing fine. And Bobby was there. You know, it was, like uh, just, just us three didn't have any bodyguards, anybody around them. It was just us three having a conversation. I was like 15, 16. And that was the last time that I saw Whitney Houston. It was the second time that I met her. I never knew her personally. Like we were never friends or I never called her or talked to her on the phone or anything like that. The only, the closest connection I had with her was the, the Narda Michael Walden. Uh, he used uh, to call her from the studio but I never talked to her, but he used to call from studio and let her hear. <laughs> Cause I used to sing just, I used to try to imitate her. And so he would let her, <laughs> he would let her hear like tell me what you want me to do and stuff like that. Like, oh, so she I'll never knew, you. she never knew that you were, that she was your hero? Yes. Oh yeah, she knew. And it was too overwhelming yeah, yeah. for no, you she... to strike a friendship? I was a kid. He was, a kid. He was 15. Was a kid. Yeah, he yeah, was... was... uh, yeah. You know, I, but she, she knew, she knew okay. that I, I, she knew that I freaking loved her. Uh, I told her when I saw her, especially that time in the hall, I mean, you know, it was her and Aretha. I could never act normal when I saw these two women. I remember seeing Aretha on Broadway. We were some Broadway show. All right. And she, and she comes with these, you know, her, whoever she was with and just 10, just huge entourage. Yeah. <laughs> and she knows me. I've seen her many times since I was 12 years old. I even came to sing for her. She invited me to sing Always in My Heart, which was one of her favorite songs. She invited me to sing that for her at right. some event. I think it was a birthday party. And so I saw her and I couldn't even leave. You know how you do this, this thing when you, mm -hmm. you know. Right, right. You don't push <laughs> I call that the I Mariah. <laughs> I, but you know, because you, you don't want to put your lips on. I you leaned left, in. Right. Yeah. I couldn't even, I just, I couldn't even do that. I couldn't do the, the cheeks just touch. I bet she was like, what the hell is wrong with this? But I was so nervous to even like, like, but she could tell, she could just, she knows. She, she and every time she saw me, she's like, how's your mom? How's your mom? She used to that. I, I, she was. I, I, I digress, I digress. Whitney, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I don't know where we even were with the question. I don't know what I was asking. No, just meeting your heroes. Never. That's all right. So for yeah. you, um, were were you able to bond with a circle of people like who would you consider you know like okay so when i came in the business then i became friends with common and we became friends and started hanging like did you have peers that you no. regularly hung with and no because i was 12 so there was nobody else my age okay doing what i was doing yeah, in our minds, you were real friends with Tatiana Ali. In, in our teenage minds, right. it was like they were best friends. <laughs> no, not really. We 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 were friends. Yeah. Uh, but you know, 
Uh, I hung out with a lot with the boys. Remember the group, the boys? Oh my God, Hakeem, yes. Hakeem yeah. and them. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the Sons of Light. The Sons, Sons of Light. Of light. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We, 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 we broke a lot of lamps in, in the hotel rooms and stuff. And me and my brother and the boys used to hang out a lot. So the boys, but I did bond with them. Like we were just so, but, but the uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, mm -hmm. those years now, I was pretty much a loner. <laughs> Damn, Tevin. Plus, I suck. <laughs> not really. But you had a lot. You had a lot going on too. You had some things. You, you know, self discoveries was, and whatnot. You know what I mean? There was so. there was a lot going on. There was a lot yeah. going on. I don't think I even realized how much was going on until a couple of years ago when I actually started to process everything. So I mean, like I said, I don't regret anything. But there's a lot of there are more pros than there are cons to being mm -hmm. a child a childhood star or former child star. You know. It's, I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, thing to be able to say that and survive. How long, it, it, on average, does it take you to get through a take where you're satisfied with it and the producer's satisfied with it and all parties involved are satisfied? It depends. It, they used to call me one take seven when oh. I was a kid. Talk your shit. So, I, I'm not, I didn't make that up. I did not make that up. I swear to God, that's Babyface gave me that name. Uh, so how many takes for Can We Talk? The, I don't remember how many takes I did Can We Talk. It, it wasn't a lot. I, back then, I just went in and, and I hated actually being in the studio. I wanted to be in the streets. I you wanted to, to play. Okay, I get it. <laughs> I wanted to play. I wanted to go driving around in my car and just be in the studio. Oh. I, I, you know, it was like work to me. If I had to do it more than three or four times, I, you know, I was a brat. So, but with Babyface, it was all about the feeling. It wasn't about necessarily the technicalities of it. But with Narda, Michael Walden, it was all about the, the technicalities and the notes. Mm -hmm. They can't be sharp and they can't, and the feeling. So you have to have both. Um, so I think Narda really, I had the most fun working with him because I worked. I, he made me work and I, and I didn't warm up really. And, and to this day, I don't warm up until hours after I start singing. So you have to keep singing, you know, that, you know, I had to learn that about myself too. But Narda was the best. He, I had the most uh, nurturing working relationship, I think, with Narda. Okay, can I ask a question? And Fonte, you can even weigh in because you sing a lot. Is because, you know, we've been doing this show for five years and literally no singer, or at least singer singers, has yeah. given me the, 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 the dream answer that I want to hear it's like, yes, you know, before I do a song, I sit and do me, 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 like three hours and drink all this tea. You know, like everyone basically says, hey, man, I showed up, I sang it and then I went home. So is is the idea of warming up just a myth that non singers like myself think that an artist has to go through to do their craft or. Like even for you, Fonte, like even when you're doing your your records, like I think it just depends on the song. I think if it's you know, if it's something where because I've had takes where, you know, you'll write something and then sing it and I'm like, OK, this sounds cool, but I can do it better. And then you'll come back and do it, quote unquote, better. But there's just there may be just some vulnerability in the first take because you're just now learning the song. You know, what I mean, and you don't know it, know it versus singing it when you know it. It may, you know, it just may not fit the song. If the song you're singing has to have a, a hint of vulnerability or uncertainty, if you're, if that's the character you're playing, quote unquote, then the first take generally, for me, you know, those early takes, that's kind of where the magic is. Once you get, I go back to what Tevin said, once you get like three, four times at that point, you're just, just kind of regurgitating the same thing. It's, it's kind of like a rehearsal at that point. And the, the, the magic is lost in, in my experience. Once you overdo it and keep on doing it. Yeah, yeah. You kind of sing the life out of it. You know what I mean? So a lot of times the first ones, those are the ones, if they may not be the most technically great, they right. are the ones that are the most honest and may fit the song better. Is that I, kind of for you, Tevin? Is that the same thing? Or similar to yeah, that? I, yeah, I think you are right on that. And I think it depends on the song and I think it depends on actually the singer also. Every singer has this whole different way of approaching the song and approaching the you know, performance of the song. Some singers can walk into the studio and give a great performance without you can warm it up. <laughs> you know, I mean, there are singers that can do that. There's a lot of, excuse me, there are a lot of songs that Aretha did that she did warm up. She wow. just walked in and she just did. 
Aretha. Some people, you know what I'm Baby saying? Babyface like, says that and it's a, she won't go more than two takes. Like, that's it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I don't think, I, I think that's the way it's always been. And she can do that, you know? Uh, some singers can't do that. And she can deliver all the, the things that need to be in the song in those two takes. So, but it's definitely those first takes, I think. And I think if you ask a movie director also, uh, for like Frank Sinatra didn't like do, doing more than one take on the scene. He liked to just do it one take because he felt like that was the most natural to the most real world. Right. I feel like if he over, did it over and over again, it would lose his magic, like you said. So I agree. Wait, this is a question. I, 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 I'm so glad I, I remember this. Okay, your, your, your first album, uh, which is the spelling of your name, was that supposed to be an acronym for something? You got dots? T E V I N, uh, or were you just yeah. spelling it? Or uh, actually, I, made first up of all, <laughs> oh, Wait, no. what'd you say? What'd you say? Oh, I made up. Oh, an I made up. Right, what's that? Oh, oh come on! Oh, no. <laughs> Transmitting every vocal immaculately, nigga. Hey! Oh, because <laughs> you know, nigga, has to be in it. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> That's it Wait, right there. I put it on Twitter. Right it was like, it was Somebody flip. Twitter. This was That's like Twitter it. like years ago. I think it was when, you know, I think somebody, they tried to like come for you or something on Twitter and everybody was just like, nah, fuck that. That's Seven Campbell. And that was one of the things I posted. It went off. They always coming for me on Twitter. I know what you're talking about. That yeah. But we had your magic. back though, bro. Like we had your back. Y'all did. Twitter, it, it was, had, yes, yes. I was like, oh, it was really cool. I love it. I love Fonte, it. You come All Twitter. right, Fonte, let me go. Let me go to the other side because <laughs> let me go to the other side because I believe you two were kind of the same age. Or what yeah, year were you absolutely. born, Fonte? I'm 78, so yeah, we right there. Yeah. Okay, so what was it like? Seven, are you 78? I'm 76. So you you are. Hey. I am your elder. So Fonte, as a listener, did that make an impression on you to see someone your age doing that? Like as the same way that I saw the Jackson five or Janet, like, oh, kids my age, you know, that's nah, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. I, I, even though, like, again, we were only were two years apart. He was older, but it definitely felt like uh you know, he felt telling him it felt like one of the homies like I went to school with, or like that homie that like sang in church, and you just know, okay, that's a singing homie, and like he gonna he always sang it, you know, and he just don't, be you know what I mean? Like <laughs> it was like that. It's like he got singing homie that just like gonna body everybody in the talent show, and that's what it is. So um, yeah, the first album, man, that was something that uh, it definitely felt like it was, and and I always talk about this for songwriters. It is very hard to write. For kids, you know what I'm saying? Because you have to write something that's age appropriate, but also have something that, you know, adults can jam to, you know, a record mm -hmm. like a Dial My Heart or mm -hmm. uh, a, a Round and Round or Can We Talk? I mean, those are <laughs> really hard songs to pull off. And I don't All think right. So understand. then what about yes. uh, what about us? Break it down. Well, yeah, that, was, listen, yeah. that, listen. One, that was the one like in homeroom, like because they were playing on the radio, like they would play that joke on the yeah. radio. It was almost like. Oh man, it's that it's that Tevin Campbell joint. And so in homeroom, we were talking about it. Yo, you hear that joint? Do you have to school like some homework? Like hell. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, was, I was like, wait, what? He getting me? Home? Yes. Are you getting? Yes, I am. Yes. Well, I, well yo, I have. While we here, while we on the first album, I have to say <laughs> my favorite one, like my probably like my favorite. If I had to pick one, come on, Fonte, album. let it be the same as me. Come on, come on. Man, along with you, dude. Like along with uh, you. Uh, there is nothing uh, else uh, I read. Uh, and so dude. my question, my question for you on that one, bro. So I did not know. I actually lost a bet to this over this to a friend like years ago. <clears throat> She wanted to bet. She hears this this uh thing. Yeah, she totally won. So I did not know. I had the album. Casey and JoJo are seeing backs on that. Uh, they're listed in the credits. It, I know. I, okay, listed. well, then they're, yeah, okay. Well, then you're right. I know <laughs> it's out there. Well, now, I can tell you the for a fact, they did all the, yeah, they did all the demos for all those songs. So all the, oh, all wow. the songs that, that I'll be produced KC and Jojo did all those demos, which is why I'm singing you, all those lick, all those rock. Like, did it, did it, did it, did it. That's uh -huh. Jojo. I mean, that's not me. I, I'm, I'm doing whatever they did on the demo. 
So uh, I would still have those demos. Oh my God, I wish Fuck I could. Amir, always. I wish I did. <laughs> maybe Al, maybe Al has them now. Right. Al probably. Al, Al probably has them, Amir. He got all the tape. <laughs> I thought, Fonte, I thought you was going to say, just ask me to. I always thought that was a, a soundtrack joint, but I, I didn't yeah, know that, that was, was on. on. Uh, it was on, uh, it was on Boys it was, in the Hood. It was on Boys in the Hood, but they decided to put it in, in um, on the album. I thought that was interesting what you said, though, because yeah. Warner Brothers didn't care about that. They, they, what they had was a kid that could, that had this, and I realize it now. I didn't realize it back then. Uh, that had this voice that was a mature voice that they could sell mm. to a whole bunch of adults. And and I was actually, and I think it's actually kind of cool that I was being used as like a muse, like for mm. you know, all these love songs that these guys, Babyface and, and, and Narda, you know, Narda teenage love through. songs. Mm. No, but he was going through stuff with his. Uh, wife and, and at the time and so I, I i realized now that they were writing and i was saying you. their spirit yeah. and channeling through you wow yes because i didn't know anything about anything about that stuff come on and, tell me what you want me to do and and then that knowing that cool. we were using it to make out with because that's, <laughs> that's disgusting. what we were that's doing pretty disgusting. putting it on mixtapes just. <laughs> oh <laughs> listen along with you was a staple on my slow jam mixtape <laughs> Man, <laughs> would never no really like your work with Al B, man. I gotta say, like, yeah, goodbye. Like, yeah. Man, I love, oh, thank I you. Love that song, man. Like, I love man. that stuff too. I think he did a great job on the first album. It had to have been five or six singles, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, goodbye. Yeah, Tell yeah, me what yeah. you want to do. Uh, round and round. Uh, you got some just ask me to confuse on the play. Yeah, one song, some, like, there was at least six singles off this joint. And so, like, who 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 was the ringleader that said, "Okay, I'm like I'm what I say goes." As far as like your head, is it is it Benny that's driving the I wheels? Was. Is it- Excuse me. <laughs> I really was. No, I'm telling you the truth. I mean, Benny Medina was was the yeah. I mean, but I'm the one that got to choose the songs. Yeah, they worked me. They sent me everywhere. So yeah, Warner Brothers was responsible for. Um, well, for on the that. other side of that question, uh, are there any notable songs that were submitted to you that you passed on that someone else took and did something with? Oh no, I can't. I can't. Did, no. Well, you took all the hits. Any, not any famous. Uh, not anything to shoot. No. No. <laughs> I All took right. the hits. I gotta go I there. Took the hits. Are you are you familiar with the Usher story? With uh... okay, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Wait, I forgot, oh, Amir. I forgot. Okay. I forgot. Oh, okay. I, I, you no, know. no, well, I think that's actually a true story. I think that uh, it, I think it's in L.A. Reid's book. I know that that, from my understanding, I think L.A. Reid wanted Usher to have. Can we talk? But they uh, have me to have to. He wanted me to have Can We Talk, and uh, but I had it. it, it you know, I, I don't even, listen, Thanks. I love Usher. I love him. I actually just uh, did a gig with him. Really? Uh, in Atlanta, yeah, Tyler Curry. So we shared the same stage. That's dope. I love Usher, I always have loved Usher. You birthed him. Uh, I, that was my wine. I, I don't, that was my wine. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, there was your, there was your, that was, there my was wine. your moonshine. Yeah. Oh, you're drinking wine? Nice. You start. <laughs> oh. Damn, I'm the only one without. It's a cool cup, Tevin. It's an aluminum got cool cup. over here. Oh, yeah, no. No, I, I, I don't believe that can we, can we talk? And uh, first of all, it's a great, so I'm not saying it, 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 the, 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 it's so well written. Um, and I said this on something else somebody asked me about it. I could never, I, I got it bad as one of my favorite R&B mm-hmm. mm-hmm. ballads. It always has been. I could never sing I got it bad like Usher and I don't believe Usher could sing Can We Talk like I could. You know it's You Got It Bad, but that's okay. I know you ain't being shady. It's, it's You okay. Got It Bad. Okay. I, no, it's, oh, it's, yeah, You Got It Bad. You Got It Bad. You got it, you got it bad. No, I know I wasn't being shady because I do have a song called. <laughs> there you go. 
No, I swear to God. No, no, it, that song sucks. No, there's nothing compared to No, You Got It Bad. But that was my favorite and still is one of my favorite R&B songs now. When I hear it, I'd be like, okay, yeah. And, ah, no, 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 no. But anyway, it, it so, yeah. yeah and I, I read the thing he said about the can we, no, it was my song. Let me have it. I mean, right. you know, let me have my song. It's my song. That was your song. That's your song. Uh, that's my song. I'm blessed to have it. It's a, it's an amazing song. It, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's a beautiful song, and I love it. You know, and I love that it's mine. And I didn't used to be like this. I used to be like, oh, I don't want to hear it. But now I listen to it. I actually will listen to it. Good for Tom you. Sometimes. They're like, you know what? That's a good song. Nah, <laughs> you know, it's I'm actually embracing my uh, my art. You know, so I. Uh, I'm very, very blessed and honored to have that song in my workshop, in my record. I had a uh, question regarding your work with uh, with Nardo Michael Walden, because two of the records that I really love on I'm Ready was uh, Don't Say Goodbye Girl and Brown Eyed Girl. Like, yeah. those, do you have any memories of like recording those two? I really, I really love those records. Oh, thank you. I co-wrote Brown Eyed Girl. Hey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, Nard is, a, I, I remember, he likes to sit down and just start playing on the piano. And he'll just he'll just say start singing, whatever mm -hmm. comes to mind. Just start singing. That's how we came up with "Tell Me Which One to Do." That's how we came up with uh, "Brown Eyed Girl." Uh, "Don't Say Goodbye Girl" was a song that he had written already, though. I love "Don't Say Goodbye Girl." That's I the love one, that yeah. song. I love that song. That's yeah. one of my favorite of my vocal performances in on, on any song because that's why I mean he works you. He worked me, man. Like I had to work to get those notes. You know what I'm saying? I like, can he hear it. Yeah. And there's no kind of there's no sort of uh, Alt alterations or anything on that. That's all me getting that out. Like he's like, do it again, do it again. And he wouldn't stop. He wouldn't give me a break. Do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. And coffee, that's how I got addicted to coffee. But anyway. Um, <laughs> well, wait, let me ask you because <laughs> the Narda, the, the Narda Michael that I know, um, because because of his him being a Buddhist and everything, he mm. talks very gentle. <laughs> is he like that in the is he like that in the studio? Or if he's just like yes, no, he's like that's your difference, man. That's your difference. You coming down and give me some feeling, yes. And he gets the all the incense and everywhere. Yeah, that's right. Him. Wow. That's him. I, that's you know, him. I think I think that's the ultimate. <laughs> Jedi, I think it's the ultimate Jedi mind trick because um, I know there's a there's another person who's a uh, Buddhist in my life, and she has the ability. She'll start here, but somehow she'll calm me down, and she'll talk very low. And then the next thing I know, I'm talking very little too. And I realized that's a Jedi mind trick. So yeah, yeah, I, I always wanted to know with Narda, especially that the fact that Narda has what I call going into the lion's den. Like you have mm. to have a level of, of social wisdom if you're producing Aretha and Whitney Houston. And like, you know, his his entire canon of, of people that he's produced are singer singers yes. so i know yes. that he has to have some sort of jedi mind trick that gets you guys to trust him and i always wanted to know what that was like it, it it's just it's his it's his, it's, it's his uh spirit you know what you just described his whole so when you walk into the studio that's the that's the vibe that you get you know so you don't mind working um but you know what it's it was the coffee for me and it was just him being cool and he would record all the sessions. So I knew the camera was right on me. So I would really literally try to sound my best, you know? Oh, he would like, uh, oh, wait, he would like video, like take- Oh, he no, got he a library. Had, okay. Just a yeah, yeah. He got a library. Yeah. Yo. Which is Yo. <laughs> sure, shit, don't say nothing now, but That's yeah, crazy. he got- so I'm sure he did Whitney that way. I'm sure he, he did- Ah, uh, oh, damn. That's so you should have known that, cool, Amir. Yeah. Oh, we definitely get Nardo on this show, man. <laughs> you got to get him on. I'm mean, sure he has some great stories. But it, it he creates an atmosphere in this studio, Tarpan Studios. It really helps, man. When you walk into that atmosphere, you're ready to work. And he makes you believe that you can do it better. You can do it better. Do it one more time. You can do it better. And then you do it. Like, at what point in your career, as far as your, your albums are concerned, where you feel as though, as an artist, you have ideas that you want to express in production that you want and certain sound that you want like are uh, was... are they letting you get a word in edgewise or is it still like 
here, work with this person, here, work with that person. And No, I had no interest in anything of that sort. I was too busy trying to figure out uh, life. Life, yeah. And I had no time to figure out life because I was working. So I didn't care. All I, 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 you know, I got to choose the songs. That's it. I wouldn't sing okay. anything that I didn't like. That no okay. one made me sing anything I didn't like. I had to last dibs on the songs. But as far as trying to say something or do a please, no. no. I didn't think of anything like that. I mean, besides like the radio shows where they would do like a summer jams or a powerhouse where you come and just do your two joints. Like, did you ever have an actual touring experience, at least similar to the one, um, like when you did Round and Round on Arsenio, uh, Prince's Band was your backup and that, yeah. that shit was perfect to me. It was great. But Thanks. like, how often did you really get to go out on the road with a band and, and tour and that sort of thing? Did, did that happen at all? Or was it just like spot dates? It happened. Yeah, no, that that didn't happen a lot. So my mom didn't didn't allow a lot of that stuff. She, because I was already traveling doing. Promo you have that option. And, oh, I mean, you, you have the option to say no. I don't want it to work because I would figure like, in the nineties, you got a tour, right? His mama had that option, right? My mom was she didn't play. I went on one tour with Boys to Man and Babyface. I opened up for that Ooh. tour. Ooh. Okay. And that was for I think three weeks. And that was on my Christmas break. And that's it? Oh, my mom didn't allow, but I was working so much already. I don't, that's why I think that's probably why she didn't allow it. I was always traveling, promoting the album. Uh, but, but that's touring, the money, did, right? Touring is like the money though, really, right? Not when you're not, then. oh, okay. Uh, it wasn't the same as it was now. I mean, I don't think, uh, I don't hmm. know. I mean, it would be, no, I <laughs> I can't think of any, and plus I was one of the only kids doing it, but I, I think the boy groups went on tour. So maybe like the new kids on the blocks and um, I can't even think of any other boy right, groups. Right, who else was around? Right. New edition. Uh, new edition, I, yeah, they probably went on tour, but. Uh, so it would have been hard to pair was, you with someone. Yeah, exactly. It, that, yeah, because I was but like, I was wondering that because with Tracy Spencer and Brandy, like Tracy Spencer would have been good. Yeah, yeah. Where the hell is Tracy Spencer? Good. Ain't she a veterinarian or something? Oh wow, she, that's pretty cool. I someone she told me that she does like, uh, like spot commercials where like, I mean, you don't know that that's the mom in the supermarket or that sort of thing. Oh, I, wow. I believe that that's like her lane, like she's done a bunch of- We did a sim, they all knew each other, right, Amir? I'm like, so Tevin, you knew Tracy, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I really think that my mom, I know my mom was very protective of me when I was when I was a kid in the business. She didn't, you can ask anybody, you know, she didn't, uh, she was very protective. I so I was, uh, but she couldn't stop me from <laughs> being a pest. But when it came to like, uh, like, just working and she had to make sure who was gonna be around me. And I had these uh, people from Warner Brothers, Carolyn Baker and Jean Shelton. It was always the yeah. ones that would travel with me when she wasn't with me. You know, she was very protective of me. So okay. I think that's probably a lot of the reasons why I didn't go out on tour. That would explain no hip hop collaborations. Not, well, I ain't seen, were there any Well, no, cause I got well, no, mad I, questions. I, I got <laughs> questions about Back to the World because to me that was such, a, a shift, at least working with 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 the hitmen and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, could you mm -hmm. talk about that experience with working back to the world? Yeah, that was a confusing time in my life because uh, I didn't really understand what was going on with the whole Warner Brothers situation, mm -hmm. and uh, at what that time I didn't understand. Nothing. Well, put on one. Oh, okay. Nothing. Nothing was going on. <laughs> I didn't understand why, why Back to the World wasn't. They, 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 it was sort of like they, sort of like just forgot about me. Mm. And I, and. Uh, but it's like you had all the pieces in place. At least I know Chucky did stuff on it, and and like the Hitman, Stevie J. I don't. Yeah. You know, I don't know what Puff's role is as far as like. Is he there just to slap his name on the thing, or is he no, there was, like? He was, <laughs> he was there. 
Okay. Uh, I'm not gonna even. Yeah, he was. <laughs> he was there. All right. He's there, and and Puffy's great. We both Scorpios, and he was there, and then and you know he wasn't there, and then he was there again. So let's just put it that way. But yeah. that wasn't that wasn't it. It was um, there was just a shift in the whole Warner Brothers makeup. So Bo Austin, Hank Span, Ray Harris, all those guys left. Left, yeah. The shift was not on black music anymore. It wasn't on me anymore. It was on some other thing, and so right. I mean. And I didn't understand it at the time. I understand it now. It's a business. But at the time, I did not understand it. So that was sort of a weird time for me. And so I showed up at the photo session for that album with, with, with um, Twist. Twist. And they were like, what the hell did you do? I was like, yeah, I got Twist. Yeah. Just just rebelling, you know, yeah, being right. mad. Um, you know, uh, so, yeah, that was, that was not a good time for me. My favorite pre- record pre- on that album was the... Um, I don't know if it was a single, but could it be? Like, that's still... like. Could it be? Oh, that. thank you. Thank that's you. I love that record, too. You remember the record, that too. One? You have any memories of it? With, uh, working with I do have memories being in the studio with Rasan. Because uh, he wrote all that stuff. He wrote Rasan Patterson? Stuff, but, yeah. Patterson? Yeah. Did you yeah. work with Keith Crouch as well? Or? Yes. He was on that Keith, album. Yes. Yep. Keith Crouch. Jamie Jazz. Jamie um, okay. Jazz. Yes. It was a great... It was fun recording it. I had a great time recording the album. It was just uh, when they were trying to prepare for, for the release of the album, I was trying to rebel against one of them. I was like, man, I was, in, know, in, so hindsight, I was, in hindsight, yeah. did you feel as though like you just wanted to break because you basically been doing this since you were 12, like without any breaks or whatsoever? Or did like Maybe in your mind, it say it again? Maybe that's what it was subconsciously. Maybe I wanted to break. I don't know. Maybe that's what it yeah. was. Because there were three years between I'm ready and back to the world. Like what was what were you doing in, in that uh in a <laughs> What was I doing? <laughs> no, I love it. Ain't nothing wrong with it. I well, I had I I graduated uh high school in ninety five. Okay. And I think uh we started probably recording it in ninety six. I'm ready came out in ninety three. Yeah. You're right. So so by, by this, oh, yeah, you know, we got uh, the Goofy movie that was '95. I did, I did a lot of stuff in between. There was a lot of soundtracks and a lot of stuff I did in between. That. Oh, boom, 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 boom. hey, Yo, just... we're forgetting something. We're forgetting something. Which one is it, dude? Can you please talk about Black Men United? Oh, oh. oh. Hey, Yo, we would have. Yo, we we <laughs> always <laughs> there's always that one moment when the interview's over. And we're we kicking ourselves because we forgot to ask something. Uh, and I was like, oh, yeah. I know we're forgetting something. Now, that you is you. Know. That's you yeah. will know, right? You yeah. will know. Yeah, he's on the first. You sung uh, lead off on that one. <laughs> yeah, no, let's yeah talk. man. Yeah, you will know. I mean, yeah. I just remember the video shoot. Uh, again, being a pest. And I showed up at the video shoot. I think I got into an argument with somebody. And, and I left the video shoot. That's why you see me in the booth on the video by myself. Uh-huh. Not with everybody else. I know some, there's you some other after the, doing it after the fact. Yeah, but yeah, it was bad. How, how old were you? How how old, Tab? How old were you? God, I don't know. What was our? Well, you would know came out in 95? 95. Okay, so that was high school. 94, so like 94. 94. I was, I was like 18, 94, 19. 18, 19. Yeah. Such a brat. I was such a brat. But that's a great song. That's a great song. I like the live performance better than the, I like the, the, the record, but the the live performance when we're all on stage. Yeah, you guys did it at the American Music Awards and did you do it on Arsenio as well? I don't think so. I remember the American Music Awards. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. I could be wrong about Arsenio though. But Okay. Well, I um, I, I know I've seen it once. Um yeah. oh, so you really didn't get a chance to So it was the thing where they just sort of gathered all the people on that song at different Places and yeah. they did their parts and it wasn't like you guys. Kevin said I left. I was gone. Yeah, I, I left. I was I was something else. I left. So I got I got into it with somebody because I was late and I just left. You got into it with somebody, somebody because you was late. You got uh, into it. Yeah. yeah, I was. It wasn't brat. D'Angelo. I, you, I, was, so. I was a mess. <laughs> right, right, right. No, it wasn't D'Angelo. So some, ah. so, oh. somewhere there's I'm, I'm an elder. D. I'm playing D. Don't, don't kick my ass. I'm but somewhere there's <laughs> an elder who's been watching you from the jump, and they're like, yeah, that stage in Tevin's life wasn't my favorite. He was a little bit of an asshole. There's somewhere. Uh, there's I had, 
I had angels watching over me. I'm telling you that much. I, I but I was, I was a kid. I, I, I had to. I had a lot of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Authority. So to, uh, yeah, you know when you give kids store authority, sometimes. Uh, so wait to that question. It's interesting because you were you were one of the first of an era in that way. So do do the other young guys who kind of followed in your footsteps? Does anybody ever go? You know what? Let me call Tevin. I know he's been through this. I, I hope they don't. I, I don't have anything. I can't. <laughs> you ain't got nothing for him. Well, the thing, I have nothing for him. You have to sort of is, go through that, life, your own life, and, and learn from your own. Experience. Unless I'm under a rock somewhere, it's not like, you know. Of course, you came right, right before social media. Mm-hmm. Was even oh, a thing. Thank God. So, lucky for you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Lord Jesus. Imagine my childhood on social media. Yeah. Lord. I mean, you know, it's crazy. You know, the 90s, the stuff that we did back in the 90s. But anyway, sorry. All right. I got to ask did you crash a car or something? Oh, yeah. I crashed it plenty of times. Me, me oh, and God. Hakeem crashed several cars. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I, what was your first like car? Since you were a car person, what was your car <laughs> like? What was I your came first with car? Oh, oh my, what was my first car? Yeah, because you loved them so much, too. Uh, I only had a couple of cars. It was what the big, long Mercedes. Uh, oh, the West African joint? I can't remember. No, oh, the S500. Back then, that was 92. Mm-hmm. Oh, I had damn. the long gray. Yeah. And, I DC, had, we, and then I had a... Uh, we call them Nigerian Benzes, yeah. Oh, they're coming to yeah. America. <laughs> What's uh, that? <laughs> coming to America. Uh, okay. Joppy Joe Farrell. Right. Oh, my God. Y'all are bringing back some crazy memories right now. Just, I'm picturing <laughs> myself riding around in my car. I'm like, oh. Can't no, even parallel did. park that, John. <laughs> I did some drunk driving and all that stuff. Like, I did bad things. I did bad crashes. Damn. Oh, they are so lucky. Oh, they I'm, so I'm only bad. asking because, like, I just generally never just. It wasn't like you. I, I don't think that you were in that Britney Spears lane where it's sort of like, ah, uh, man, I don't think he's going to make it. Or he came that before. Sort of thing. Yeah, it wasn't like train wreck. Well, I, I don't remember. Well, Britney, well That's she's after. white. When, you, when you're when you white and in the business, you, I didn't have to worry about paparazzi and stuff like that. That's not something that, you know, um, I don't know. I, I, I'm not trying to be racist or anything like that, but it's no, just so, true. Like, this is one of the benefits where. Being black. black famous versus white. Yeah, famous. don't right. worry, Steve ain't paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, say what you're supposed to say. <laughs> Damn, Steve, you're you're really on the 12th floor right now. Yeah, he's oh doing. Yeah, Steve did went to the grocery store. <laughs> he didn't. He, he, he didn't mastered a couple set audio. Listen, go ahead. Tell what you're gonna yeah, do. I was gonna say no. This, this, this is probably the rare no. situation where being black benefits you in the fact that if you were white, you would probably have been on. Oh the globe and whatnot um as far as a mentor is concerned like who would you say was there anyone that could get through to you like as far as being a mentor a a a quincy figure or whatever at that time no no was you was you listening to miss Rhonda, your mama (laughs) just i no And then when I didn't, I fell on my ass hard too. Yeah. So my mom was pretty much the only person I could get to me. You know, that's kind of the lesson that I'm learning now. Like, oftentimes the universe or life will present a situation to you in which you can either heed the call or continue, you know, it's sort of be hard headed. And oftentimes people only learn the lessons when they hit a rock, rock, rock bottom. And it so, felt like the hairspray period of time too was a turnaround. Like I felt like hairspray was a whole lift me. Like it was a. Well, I had I have I've had many turnarounds, but yeah. most of them I didn't listen to, I didn't pay attention to. <laughs> no, I don't mind talking about it. No, okay. someone just got a call. Uh, Quest, they were trying to find me, and they called Quest Records, and they finally located me, and they asked me to come out and read for this part. So it was uh, Matt Lins who was the assistant director. His partner recommended me for the part of Seaweed. He was like, where's Tevin Campbell? And they found me. Wow. And I came out and I auditioned in front of all the people, the directors and everybody. And then I walked out and they didn't call me back in and told me, you got the part. 
so I played the seaweed and hairspray for like right. on Broadway for like uh, four years. And then I went to Australia and lived out there for two years and did it with a whole different cast and directors. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So I played seaweed for like six years on the Broadway, on, on the theater stage. All right. Can you answer something for me? Australia. And I keep trying to tell people this, <laughs> that, you know, I come from Philadelphia, which was, you know, at one point, you know, they, they, they held the torch for a certain type of soul music. Okay, I'll say it, Neo Soul. I don't see Neo mm. Soul as a four letter word um, anymore. But oftentimes, like, you know, on <laughs> social media, whatever, um, just the amount of, of soul singers that I see in Australia is staggering. Um, and it just so happens that one of my Black productions. Ones? Check. Uh, no, I mean, all, all over. But here's the, here's the deal. So, uh, Ruan, my. Uh, my production, uh, my one of my uh, managers, uh, when I was DJing during the pandemic, he's kind of like my DJ manager tech guy. Um, he's from Australia. And he explained to me that similar to the UK, you know, like we live in America where basically corporate radio controls the music that you're listening to six, mo six months from now. You know, a, a, a clear channel will have already pre-programmed you know, the next little baby song or the next Doja Cat song, like we're going to play this 50 times. And, you know, they, they have monopolies, which is why we hear the same songs over and over and over and over and over. Whereas government radio, i.e. BBC One, BBC Two, and the same with Australia, um, it's still kind of like eh, 1978 or 79 in America where they actually trust the DJ to be like, this is cool, this is not cool, this and so as a result, Rue explained to me, because I was trying to, it's like suddenly out of nowhere, I just start hearing like music that I would have gravitated towards, but by these Australian musicians. I mean, you see it now with Hiatus, Coyote and all that, but yeah. Rue was basically explaining to me that on mainstream radio, you know, Erica Badu got equal time, you know, to... Justin Timberlake or Christina Aguilera or whatever. Like it wasn't like pop radios here and black radios here. Like they don't got black all... radio in Australia, right? They got no, but that's the thing. And that's why yeah. a festival, there's there's a, a there's a soul festival that's almost like three times the size of Coachella, in which the lineup is basically like the Roots Picnic on steroids. Like every time you <laughs> see the lineup, I think it's a gag or like not true. It'll be like Maxwell, D'Angelo, you know, SWV. Da, da, da. Like, imagine seeing that sort of lineup, but just with every black actor you ever loved. And I, mm -hmm. my whole thing was when you were living down there, did you notice uh, a love for black music or even your catalog that you weren't finding in the States at all? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and both on the radio and from the cast I was working with. So the girl that played the lead part, who was like 20, I don't know, six, 25, she mm -hmm. started singing Good Times by Aretha Franklin. I literally almost had a nervous breakdown because I had never heard a white <laughs> girl singing Good Times by Aretha Franklin, literally. And she had this amazing voice. She could really sing. She knew all of the oldies. And, and, and so when we were riding around, they would be playing stuff uh, that I had never heard in America by these artists, these R&B artists that I had never heard. Uh, and that kind of surprised me. And it wasn't, uh, you're right, they don't have black station, white station. They just kind of blend it all together. But they yeah. have a huge appreciation for Right. I was just trying to understand Australia as a con as, as a continent anyway. Like, do they have black people outside of the, the natives, the Aboriginal, Aboriginal people? Species. Yeah, I'm like, is there, do they have a concept of Black America and where these these lyrics come from and all of these things, or is it just like white people listening to soul? They have a con they have more of a concept of us than we do of ourselves. Because let me tell you something about Australia. If you Please go to tell Australia me. And you speak to anyone over there, they can do an American accent easy. I, you can speak to an eight year old and they can do an American accent because they study us. Right, that's an they American watch accent. Our tape and it. But what I'm saying is they know our culture. They know our culture. They know they can tell you shit about hip hop, but you, I'm telling you, it's some hip hopsters over there. They That's love true. black music. I lived there for two years. I'm telling you, it's like that. 
Now, not all of the white people are like that in right. Australia, but but I was I was surprised by the knowledge. Uh, I was surprised by the knowledge that some of these people that I have met had of black music past and present. Wow! Uh, it's, so they're it's better the students music. than the Japanese. I'll I'll put it this way. <laughs> all right, so I'll put it this way. Like literally, like there was a point where. I'll say like in 96, 97, where um, pre Fergie Peas or a group like the Jurassic Five um, or even like like uh, uh, Ben, uh, what's his name? The, the, the soul singer, ben, um, ben, Harper. Ben, Harper. Yeah, ben Harper. I mean, selling out like Yank. Can you imagine like literally the first thing was like, I, I called my boys up like, yo, man, we're we are actually open up for the Jurassic Five and we're playing like a Yankee Stadium type of venue. Like we couldn't believe like that was the big industry that basically like underground black acts get treated like gods over there. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And we couldn't we couldn't fathom it. And simply because there really wasn't an apartheid with radio yet, you know, mm. like they all got equal billing, which is. Like imagine yeah. like listen to smells like teen spirit and then like a second later they're playing like chicken grease, like an album cut. Exactly. Not like, oh, here's the single, but it's just it's crazy like that over there. It's just culture is different like too. It. So yeah. It's cool. I'm glad y'all liked it. I just didn't know if it was as much many black people to uh ex you know enjoy yeah, that are. culture. Okay, good stuff. I, there, there's some black people over there, there are a lot of Ethiopians over there, but okay. they don't live in the same yeah. area as uh um, right. as the you know. It depends on where you go. You go to Melbourne, you get their Africans that live there. Um, I'll, I'll also say this much. Um, most most of the underground, like, uh, hip hoppers, like, you know, people in, in hip hop, I, I can name, I mean, I can't rattle off names right now, but I'll say a good 10 to 20 of them have made their homes in Australia now, which is just like, mm -hmm. You know, basically, like America, just there's there's almost no future here if you're trying to make a living or make a splash as far as culture is concerned. No, I'm listening. I'm like, you know, Roe versus Wade got motherfuckers thinking different. So I'm listening to places to go. So I they, know. Will they, regu will they regulate a woman's body more than they regulate guns? And hey, yeah, I don't in Australia. Doing. I think it's pretty good over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh my like god, it's so, insane. All right, I, I, we're we're about to wrap up soon, but I, you know, for you to have this illustrious ca career, and you're like in your your thirtieth year of of being a professional, mm -hmm. um, for you is like, do you, what are your, what are your top five Tevin Campbell songs as far as like songs that you like, and don't give me that every song's my kid. Like no, I won't. I'll give you some. I'll give you some good songs. Cause uh, you're appreciating boom. them now. Okay. That's what he said. He said he's oh, I do. I appreciate my work now more than I ever have. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna give you some real answers. Um, I love. I know my redeemer liveth. I did that on the Hamlet's Messiah soundtrack. Okay. I've never even heard it. Um, no. Uh, yeah. Never heard that. I know About my what? redeemer liveth. Okay. I'll, I'll look it up. Um, uh, Can We Talk? I like my vocal, my vocal performance on there. I think it's one of the best. Uh, oh, Holy Night. All right. Oh, Holy Night. Uh, I like A Perfect World from the first album. It's okay. Just, it's, 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 I love it. Uh, I'm trying to think of a really good one that I listen to with Glee. <laughs> uh, so. So in general, if you listen to your, I mean, no one likes to listen to their first record. That's what we also discovered on the show. Like they start over judging it. So for oh, you yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, tomorrow. Definitely. Yeah. That's one of the, yeah. I enjoy listening to that because I sound totally different. Is there, are there any other bucket list uh, things that you would like to accomplish? A return to the stage, a return to the theatrical stage. Is there any of your art with performances? Are you ever going to return to the stage? Okay. <laughs> I would love to go back to Broadway, but I really, I wouldn't be happy until I won a Grammy. So, and all it takes okay. is 
one song to win a Grammy. So I really do, I'm working on an album, but I really, really want to release a, another album. I just need a Grammy. I'll be happy <laughs> to, when I win my Grammy. I, mean, can but I, I would like to act. Um, get, go ahead, I'm sorry. I would love to act. I would love to do film and TV. I've always wanted to do that. Yeah, how was Queen Sugar, man? You did the Queen Sugar for that. How what was that? Oh, that I, I wasn't, I, I should have, I need to do it again. Because <laughs> I was like, not ready. Oh but shit, I gotta catch up. What season? What season? No, I gotta catch it was up. Season four. A long time ago. It was season... years ago. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Season no. four. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I didn't get to season four yet. I'm, I'm still. It was catching years up ago. But no, acting. And I would like to write a book when I'm like 60. I would like to write a book. I, I wanted to do a podcast and talk about the pros and cons of childhood starting. But okay, so what's up? And invite, hey, invite what's a up? whole bunch of uh, childhood, former childhood stars in there. But Quest Love got a so network. Long. No, 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 you good. You could. It could be quarterly. Be really interesting. It could be bi-weekly. Okay. You make the rules on mm. podcast, Tevin. It doesn't have to be, you know, I'm just saying. Uh, dang, I had another one for you. And I was going to give you another one. I forgot what it was. I really would like to do like an album like Barry Manilow did, like classic songs. I've always wanted to do an album like that. Because I love classic songs, like uh, Frank Sinatra songs and stuff like that. But I'm just thinking out loud. Have you been saying no I, to I, feature requests, Tevin? Because I feel like a lot of these young kids, they haven't hit you up for the for the Tevin sound like they... No, you've I'm been, good. You've been saying no. I'm good. You've been saying no. <laughs> no I, I haven't been saying no, but I'm, I ain't nobody asked me nothing like that. Man. I'm I can't good. believe Tom Dollar Sign. <laughs> Tom Dollar Signs ain't call up like he I just I don't, believe, <laughs> I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Tom Dollar Sign. Thundercats. No, so I'm like with all of this, you know, everybody yeah, getting I, you know what? That's I'll the question I they did. That's the that. question I avoid the most because I hate when I'm asked that question. Like people always be like, So anybody today that you like. I didn't and, ask that. <laughs> no, 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 no. And I never asked that. But I'll just ask in general, is there anyone that's made a record in the last 10 years or something that like really touched you like okay I like that record or that song or uh, I like Jasmine Sullivan I, when I heard her uh that makes sense hotels really sort of uh talk about it. it it was interesting how she just put her, that her whole life like that story into the album mm -hmm. I guess that's kind of what I want to do with my story that I'm trying to tell and I think I, I was very impressed at how she did that and made it relatable uh, and made it enjoyable and entertaining at the same time. Uh, oh, so Jasmine can make the call and you would say yes. Okay. Oh, I, and I love her voice. You know, I think okay. she's a great singer. I, I think we have an Laura, end to Jasmine, do we? I, I think we got a little something, something, something. Okay. I think we have an end to her. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. I like Laura too. I think she's very talented. I, oh, no, uh, I want, I want her, Jasmine and you. I don't want her. <laughs> I take Lord. I, 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 her her songwriting and the way she tells stories. The, she is so dope. her album, that album influenced me. I, I think it was her last album that she released. So those two albums, I think, um, really got me to thinking how I want to write my album because um, it's not going to be "Can We Talk." It's not going to be "I'm Ready." I kind of want to tell my story um, in a way that everybody can relate to, though. So I don't want to stir people too far away from the formula, but I do have a story to tell, you know. I have stories to tell. I can't just sing about love no, all the time. Not. So Damn, <laughs> we but hear love songs I... always work and love songs are, are great and I will continue to do love songs, but they're gonna be more Tevin, uh, that's but personal. you do know that people who love you, we don't care, we're not putting you in no box. <laughs> <laughs>